Welcome. Um, today I will talk to uh, Maria Kronfeldner about the topic of dehumanization. And um, here Maria is um, an expert. She has worked and published um, extensively on what it means to be human. And here in um, particularly regarding um, the concept of human nature itself. And quite relatedly, as we shall see, um, the phenomenon of dehumanization. So the main topic of our little conversation um, today. And I just want to mention two of um, uh, Maria's um, important publications, recent publications on these related topics. So earlier this year, um, the Routledge Handbook of Dehumanization uh, came out. Maria is the um, editor of this handbook. And um, in 2018, um, she published a book with um, MIT Press uh, entitled What's Left of Human Nature. And uh, Maria works um, at the Central European University in Vienna currently, where she um, directs a project that's, of course, also related to our conversation today, her project, the epistemology of the inhuman, here inhuman, where the in is separated by the human by, by a slash. Um, that's uh, her current um, research project. And of course, I mean, as with um, all um, interesting uh, topics in philosophy of science that are socially and politically um, relevant, um, it's quite a big and challenging topic to talk about what it means to be human and dehumanization. So I thought it might be a good idea to choose a certain angle to approach the topic. And I would like to pick up um, a promise that you describe, um, a promise inherent in de uh, dehumanization studies um, that you describe in this handbook that I just mentioned that, that came out um, uh, in, um, um, in the spring no. <laughs> of, which just came out in <laughs> a couple of months ago. And there you write, so um, why should we be interested in investigating and understanding this phenomenon of dehumanization? And you write, I'm quoting, understanding dehumanization can contribute to describing, explaining, and eventually preventing the resulting in humanity. And here it's probably worth quoting the, the next sentence as well, because there you describe what these um, resulting in humanities um, really amount to. And here um, regarding this um, issue, you um, write um, the resulting in humanity includes phenomena like killing, enslaving, raping, torturing, hunting, or other forms of humiliation, oppression, subordination, coercion, exploitation, marginalization, inequality, injustice, indis uh, excuse me, <laughs> discrimination, um, and so on. And um, having this list of um, uh, inhumanities, um, I think um, it's clear what's at stake or what you suggest, what's, what's at stake, um, the intellectual and social political reward of obtaining a better understanding of dehumanization and perhaps of what it means to be human as well is enormously high. And um, my um, suggestion is, this is so to speak an entry point here, but um, before we are really in a position to um, grasp and assess this promise that I just quoted from, from your handbook, um, uh, I think we have to clarify with your help, of course, um, what um, dehumanization is and what philosophers and as well scientists investigating the subject, what they actually do, what they say and investigate about dehumanization. So um, what I would like to um, ask you as the very first question is, what exactly is uh, dehumanization as a general um, phenomenon? And um, perhaps to help us a little bit here for those 
of us who haven't read about this topic yet, um, could you give us some concrete examples of um, dehumanization that you are interested in and your colleagues working on the subject are interested in? And those could be historical examples or present day examples, whatever you like and deem important to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, first for having me and for that important first question. And um, I would be happy to give an example, but let me go back briefly to what is assumed already by what you quoted. So um, I assume that the atrocities of the kind that you listed from, from the quote, which is can be summarized as cases of inhumanity, that these are often, not always, the result of dehumanization at the cognitive or rhetorical level, meaning dehumanization means that human beings have been regarded and depicted by other human beings as less human or as not human. And if that cognitive or rhetorical level of dehumanization leads to atrocities, then you have dehumanization realized at the behavioral level as well. And then if inhumanity and dehumanization kind of can be equated, but uh, it's not the case that people studying dehumanization assume that all atrocities can be reduced to or explained by reference to dehumanization. So let me start now with a historical case to give you a little bit of a more of a body of what dehumanization amounts to. For instance, my university, Central European University, will in a few years move into a new campus, the Otto Wagner Hospital area in Vienna, also known as Steinhof area. And that campus, that site has quite a dark eugenic legacy. As part of the National Socialist atrocities, roughly 800 children were killed in the hospital, often directly by the caretakers in an institution meant to help. Many more were tortured and deported. Now, in one of our in-house discussions about how to deal with that dark legacy, the phrase evils in the house was uttered. Now, I like that phrase a lot since metaphorically it captures what happened there, evil, right? And we all know that word. But how to understand such atrocities if the quite general term evil is to taint it itself, given its religious background, for instance, mm. or given that the group of victims is quite diverse. So it included mentally disabled children, but not only. It included socially disadvantaged children, but not only. It included all kinds of misfits. And at the time, they were regarded as so-called Lebensunwert, which is translated into life unworthy of life, uh, people whose life is unworthy of life, as part of the eugenic ideology of the time. Now, so basically how to capture, what is a, a, a rich label for, for these deviants, for these people at the margins who had to face inhuman treatment from the glycans, and then they died because they weren't helped, uh, why a torture, to killing of these children. And for a variety of actual and stated reasons. Now, how to grasp, grasp what happened there? To use evil as the frame, given that it's a broad variety of victim groups and all kinds of reasons were involved, is for me, first and foremost, too laden, too religiously laden. Eugenics or euthanasia capture more descriptively and correctly what was going on but only for that very specific context of that time. It does not allow us to extrapolate to other similar situations. It does not allow us to learn from that history, but to learn, so to say, some general lessons about what people are able to do to each other is part of understanding what happened but in a deeper sense, not just the specificities of the case, so with dehumanization, I believe we can learn about the common ways 
for instance, of looking away, not just the perpetrators are an issue, but also those who looked away and were kind of uh, bystanders. And that looking away happened 100 years ago, and it happens today when, for instance, the suffering of homeless people or refugees right now is at issue to end with a more contemporary example where, again, inhuman treatment of people is at issue and where dehumanization at the cognitive level or at the rhetoric level, the way we talk, can be and very likely, given the empirical research on it, is um, a part of what's going on in the minds of the people who treat each other. So, I don't want to go on too long, given that just was the first question, but to summarize, I could say that the two terms, inhumanity and dehumanization, are the only, or at least best, general words and concepts in our contemporary language and ontology that allow us to talk about differences and similarities of the diversity of atrocities that we know from our, unfortunately, history, without denying their respective uniqueness, for instance, the uniqueness of the Holocaust, and without trivializing them by having all encompassing labels like discrimination, which are then too weak. They don't, they don't have that depth and that they don't portray the suffering sufficiently and demonization, I think, goes deeper here as well. And that is why I think it, uh, so all that to, Together, I think helps us to understand why I think that demonization, demonization helps us not just in explaining, but also in preventing or exiting, because it has this um, uh, going beyond the specificities of a singular case, and therefore I think it, it helps. And um, the one last point I think is missing to understand that explanatory and ameliorative power of the concept of dehumanization, meaning helping us to preventing atrocities and helping us to, or at least exiting, getting out of them if we're already in the middle of them. Um, because explanation goes backwards, right? And um, that emancipatory or, um, em emancipatory is wrong. I call it ameliorative power. It helps us to um, improve the way we treat each other. And um, so the, the reason why I think it has these both powers is because it reminds us about the importance of being human. It is, I think, as if we can literally see the importance of being human, the positive thing, only while looking at the contrast, while looking at the atrocities, while looking at the inhuman. So we learn about what we are interested in positively by looking at its negation or the absence of it. And mm -hmm. that's why I think the inhuman is so important <laughs> because we need to understand better the importance of, of what it means to be human. And I also noted when um, reading the handbook and also this, um, the quote I uh, started with is from the introduction um, that you wrote in, in, in the handbook. Um, I also noted that um, there are um, different forms of dehumanization. Uh, there is, so to speak, a, a gradual form and an, an absolute form of um, dehuman, dehumanization. And could you um, explain this distinction to us uh, a bit more? The, the absolute form of dehumanization means that we make it uh, categorical divide between being human, yes or no. So it's either or in that sense, absolute or categorical, because the categories is either or. And um, that happened in history that some people believe that those whom we now count as humans, as members of the same species, belong to a completely different species. So they were re literally regarded as not human. Nowadays, most of the cases that have been studied are cases of gradual demonization where the others are not regarded as not human, but as less human. So it's a matter of degree. And 
it is more frequent first because we uh, biology has made progress and it uh, people have been convinced by Darwin that we all belong to one biological species. It also connects to um, the death of at least scientific racism, that there is broad belief in that there's one um, species that intermixes so that you can't draw hard boundaries between human groups. But the shocking thing then is that even though polygenism, so believe in different species of humans, or racism, believe in different racial groups of humans that don't intermix and have uh, clear boundaries, that's broadly gone. Still, demonization shows up because even within these shaded pictures and the and one humanity, you can create a hierarchy where you can say certain people are still less human, even though they are basically in the sense of being a member of the species Homo sapiens. They are humans, but less human. And this gradual demonization is actually quite old because some. For instance, Aristotle, more than 2,000 years, sorry, more than 2,000 years ago, they were already believing in one humankind, in one big humanity. And still, he believed that women and the non-Greek, many of the non-Greek men are less human because he considered them as less rational. So you already have quite a, an old history of that graded form of dehumanization, even though now it is the dominant form of, um, of dehumanization. I see. Okay, but um, there is kind of, even if, if we back up a little bit from, the, from this distinction and your um, reply to, to the first question of what examples of dehumanization um, might be, or in fact are, um, so if you just look at the term um, dehumanization, um, one could get the impression that if a person is dehumanized in some way, then there is something that is um, in some sense taken away from that person. Well, that something might be well, whatever it means to be human for that person. Is that roughly a view you would suggest, this kind of, um, uh, let's call that a, a subtraction view of dehumanization, there is something um, taken away? And um, would you say this something is, um, is to be described by a particular view of human nature? Um, is that a view uh, you have? We, so do you need to have a positive view about what human nature consists in, in order to address the topic um, of dehumanization. Is that a view you would subscribe to? I, I think I have to um, distinguish two parts, of, between two parts of the question. First is the question about the, what you call the subtraction view, yeah. whether something is taken away. And uh, I would, would fully subscribe to that, even though I wouldn't use the, the label because I wouldn't know what would even what would be an alternative. Because the word demonization has it in it already. There is a, a D means negation, abstracting, taking away from the human. So without a concept of the human being involved, you don't have you don't, that is then taken the, taken away in the mind of the perpetrator who dehumanizes someone else, or in real life, by killing someone, you take away their human life, then you, that, that all depends on what it means to be human. So what dehumanization means depends on what it means to be human. And so that's the other side of the, that kind of double picture where you can't understand the human without the inhuman and the other way around. Or you can't understand dehumanization without assuming a concept of the human yeah i mean ju just i mean just to um make uh, my question sound a bit less silly i think as you said there what, what alternative is there um i mean what i was perhaps thinking of is of course this um subtraction idea that is seems sort of essential to dehumanization um, but one could think kind of what's um 
what's uh, subtracted is, um, I don't know, um, something about the personhood of the individual. And that is uh, not uh, the same as um, the human nature of that um, person who is um, undergoing um, a dehumanizing sort of treatment. Um, th that's perhaps what I had in mind to, to make it uh, sound less silly. And uh, my question was rather, you would go for the, um, what is being subtracted is human nature. And then you need to have a particular view about what that is. Is that roughly correct or? Um, how can I say the, uh, if you, there are cases where what is abstract, what, what is taken away, what is subtracted has to do with the concept of the person. But these are cases where you can, I think, convincingly show that personhood is then what it makes for these people, what is essential about being human, what is important about being human. So many theories in philosophy and political philosophy have given up any reference to uh, the human and yeah. focus on personhood as a more abstract concept, or as a concept that is less connected to uh, biology and uh, the actual mm. human beings existing. But that, that is then justified as an important part of our lives. So I'm not so much concerned about the word human, but um, the, the, what it allows you to not just go back to that philosophical tradition where personhood is at issue, but it broadens the focus uh, where other ways of conceptualizing being human uh, come in. Now, so I fully agree with that, and I didn't mean to, to uh, uh, put that as a, as a trivial point, because, simply because I said that I can't imagine something else. But um, what I, I meant to so that there is a simple answer to your question because it's actually quite a complex question. And the next, um, the, the second kind of interpretation of the question is way more complex to answer. And it, it goes more towards that point where the term human nature comes in or simply any kind of scientific theory about humans. And there, basically your question is, do we need a positive view? Do we need scientific knowledge about what, it, what makes us human? Or whether we call that now human nature or not, where I, I am skeptical about that label, but that's a different topic. Um, so, and my answer is unfortunately, yes and no. Mm -hmm. So no, we don't need a scientific theory of what makes us human, since any such theory involves quite important value-laden choices that are, in my view, so clearly social, political, and historically changing, so that they should always be subject to an in-depth social and political discussion and not subject to a scientific debate. So for me, and, and that for that I assume that there are no scientific experts of value judgments. And that is why I think we can't have a scientific theory of what it means to be human because it's always what it means to be human is a judgment about what we think is important about our life. Now, the answer is yes, we do need a scientific theory of what it means to be human since there are facts of the matter about being mm -hmm. human. And we should be aware of these. It's a fact that most humans walk upright rather than having to sit in a wheelchair. It's a fact that most humans have opposable thumbs, have brains of a special kind, are not, um, are not born with their beliefs and characters, but culturally influenced, they can learn and they can change their mind. Some facts of this actually quite long list of facts are more certain than others, as normal in science. And very often in the history of sciences, um, in, especially in the history of, these, of the sciences about human nature, you have many claims about being human that have been made on the basis of very insufficient evidence. 
So both these points are important, right? That we are often very uncertain about what it means about the facts about us. And that very often claims about being human have been made on a very uncertain basis and aired in the political realm without um, backing up in the appropriate sense. But then there's a third point, taking into account uncertainty and potentially abuse of scientific knowledge about humans. There's too many of these facts, simply too many of them, even if some are uncertain and some might be abused. So how to select among these facts? Which facts about us are important? Is it my imposable thumb or is it my morality or is it my rationality that makes me human? We, we have to choose between them. And that's what I mean. Sciences are important in that business of thinking and understanding what it means to be human, but they can't make the selection because it's about significant truth versus insignificant truth. And that is what where a lot of disagreement is, which are this, which are the significant truth about us? Is it personhood? Or is it something else? And, and that's that's the complex answer where I say yes or no, we need um, theories of human nature in the sense of scientific theories. And I, let me just make things a bit more complex then. Um, so um, I noted um, kind of in when reading the handbook, but also in conversations with you and um, other philosophers and scientists that, um, well, actually the handbook could have been called um, the handbook of dehumanization studies because that's something that you and other contributors emphasize that um, investigating this um, phenomenon or different kinds of dehumanization um, is not something that's only done by philosophers, but in fact by um, researchers from different um, scientific disciplines. And um, here, dehumanization studies, um, I think a term you also would like to introduce kind of a bit more actively in, in the debate is um, kind of an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, project or research endeavor. And in that respect, it's quite similar to something like climate science or gender studies or the health uh, sciences. And um, would you be able to provide us um, a picture of what, what sciences are involved in dehumanization studies? And perhaps also what issues are they interested in these different um, sub-disciplines of, of dehumanization studies? Certainly. So, so it's the name studies is always uh, <laughs> quite easy at hand nowadays. Uh, they accumulate a lot of the studies, but it just shows that we have a lot of uh, problems that uh, can be addressed from multiple disciplinary angles. So I think the first studies in the history was missionary studies where they needed geography as well as um, uh, sociology. I don't know what they needed to uh, make sure that the, the religious missionaries um, were uh, accomplishing their missions. Uh, now we have uh, all kinds of studies, race studies, gender studies, and these kinds of things. And, and they all interdisciplinary in the same sense. And I think they're not in context of climate science, they're not called sciences because we have so many humanities and social sciences involved. They are, they are issues that need um, deeply need that integration. Climate science does it too, but it's not the, the, the majority of the people working in climate science probably are still more from the so-called hard sciences. Now to, to the case of dehumanization studies, which I indeed would like to uh, use more as a label for the field, uh, which is a still emerging field. Um, so take historical approaches. Uh, historians would always be interested in the historical contextualization of a certain phenomenon. So they can contribute knowledge about 
how much actually the boundaries of humanity, where it starts, where it stops, shifted over historical contexts. Because we so often think there is a way of thinking about the human and now we have to become post-human, which is not the case, right? Because that boundary of what it means to be human has always been shifting for social reasons, for scientific reasons. So for instance, one of the scholars in the volume discusses how, how the availability of the orangutan as a living animal <laughs> that we could really study in the West um, was influencing things. That's a story, that, that is a historical perspective. A literary scholar studies how demonization is framed in narratives and whether that might help us in preventing it, accepting it, understanding it, which is more an epistemological approach, whether it's narratives or explanations that are most important for us to understand and to prevent these things happening. Psychologists, by contrast, will study the implicit cognitive attitudes in the lab, right? They do controlled conditions. They can therefore uh, go more into the nitty gritty details of certain forms of demonization and also get rid of the level of uh, utterances because they can more kind of dig into the mind and uh, trick the study participants so that we get into the to the implicit assumptions. Now, that is just listing the different disciplines, but there are, there are interactions between them. So for instance, when the psychologists in the lab try to study demonization, they need to be very precise what they mean by demonization, since an experimental study involves quite some decisions on how to measure it exactly and how to count, et cetera, et cetera. So they fix things and therefore <clears throat> are able to do what they want to do in the lab. And then you can see that sometimes they might not even reflect on, on their decisions, but sometimes they might. And the philosopher then the philosophers then can see that, as they can see from the historians, that actually it matters, right? Whether you design it that way or that way, because the, the, the outcome depends on how you design the experiment. And we know that certainly from other fields as well, but it shows up here again. And then um, it's not the psychologists actually who are biased with respect to their concept of the human that they assume when they study humanization. It's often those people from the humanities, philosophers in particular, mm -hmm who assume their very own concept of being human that they think applies to the case and that the perpetrators must have used when they did their atrocities. Might be, might not be. So you can learn from the psychologists just by looking at how they do things and what they find that you should be careful in assuming what's in your mind that it's also in the mind of the others in particular the perpetrators of atrocities. And I'm not assuming an absolute, I think that has become implicitly clear. I'm not assuming such an absolute standard that I know what it means to mm. be human. And therefore I can, I can have it easy with defining demonization. No, it's not easy because it depends what each and every one has in her or his mind about what it means to be human. See, I think I, I just want to ask an, uh, a quick follow-up question on, on dehumanization studies, um, following up on what you've um, answered to the original question. Um, and that is just to get um, kind of a better grasp on situating dehumanization studies. I think I, I was wondering and perhaps other people um, have, the, have the same question. So if we compare dehumanization studies as a sort of new and emerging field, as you said, um, how does it relate to um, already existing studies of, say, um, the Shoah genocides, um, uh, apart from the Shoah, racism, anti-Semitism, sexism, classism? So these um, issues, I mean, they are being studied. And um, I 
could, and correct me if this is the uh, wrong idea, so one um, way of viewing dehumanization studies is that they are, of course, related to all of these fields I've just mentioned. They are picking out, well, a common aspect of these phenomena. Um, is that um, how you see um, how um, dehumanization studies on the one hand and these other areas of study, like the study of the Shoah genocides and so on, are related to one another? Or, it, or is the relationship um, um, really different? And I've sort of misportrayed um, the relationship. No, you haven't misportrayed it, um, but I would like to add something. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a form, it is, a, it is, it is an umbrella or um, it, it points at the common aspect, even though I added the right. addition is, you see the commonalities, but also the differences by comparing um, different kinds of atrocities and seeing yeah. which are the, the human and therefore the, 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 the taking away the humanity in the mind of the perpetrator uh, plays a role. So, and, but I wanna, I wanna rephrase that now. So that's what I said earlier on, because it's not just an umbrella term summarizing things. It allows to go to a deeper level and, and, and let, me, let, me, let me explain it with one example that I also use in, in the handbook to show that it's a complement, not in competition to more specific explanation. So if you go to the shore or the Holocaust, um, then you see that, I think it's common, it's, it's, it's common agreement that Jewish people, on the one hand it's common agreement that Jewish people got dehumanized as less human, and in a couple of specific but different senses, as for instance, Johannes Steinzinger has nicely shown in his research as part of the Holocaust, right? So that on the one hand, that is common sense. There's something about demonization going on there, just might differ in terms of which sense exactly. On the other hand, it's also common sense that what happened to the Jewish people happened to them because they were Jew, right? So, being Jewish, not being human was an issue. So you might object, isn't the case of the Holocaust more a case where the people who faced these atrocities, the Jewish people, faced these not because they were regarded as less human, but because they were regarded as Jews. And using anti-Semitism as the explanation of the atrocities is a way more specific explanation of what happened. So you might say, isn't that a better explanation given that it's more specific? Yes, on the one hand, but it leaves out one aspect, namely that they were not just regarded as Jews, they were regarded only as Jews, you know, because they could have been regarded as Jews and as humans, and at all levels at which that might happen. And then maybe, the kind of atrocities would have been different. The assumption certainly is that whether you regard someone as human or not impacts um, the moral standing that that person or group of people has in, in your uh, perception. So that demonization really makes a difference in how people treat each other. So it's not that anti-Semitism, explaining the Holocaust, the Shoah, with anti-Semitism is in conflict or in competition with explaining it via demonization. And now you might have other factors that played a role historically so that anti-Semitism is not the only specific explanation. They all can have, they can be multiple causes, multiple influences. So they, they don't compete, they complement each other. And um, the research gets richer if we add demonization. That would be um, my, position with respect to that. Um, I mean, so far we have talked about, I mean, in this very complex field, and I'm aware of the fact that, of course, we, we can't get into all subtleties and um, we can't draw all necessary distinctions here. But um, so, I mean, so far we've talked about um, what humanization is, what historical and present day examples of that phenomenon might be which disciplines and questions um, uh, dehumanization studies include. But um, we haven't really talked about philosophy 
of um, dehumanization studies or of philosophy of dehumanization, um, maybe both, um, yet. And uh, that's something I, I, I'd be very curious about. So um, what, according to your view, what, what are the, the interesting questions in philosophy currently um, regarding dehumanization? And here, particularly one, one might think of the role of philosophers in dehumanization studies. I mean, we've already said it's a sort of interdisciplinary enterprise and one might think whatever the core issues in philosophy of dehumanization are, what can philosophers learn for their own questions from the scientists working on dehumanization? And kind of just the other way around, what do you think the scientists can learn from philosophers? Now that's a big topic. So I think what philosophers yeah. can add in principle is always has three dimensions. Um, conceptual work, so you analyze the concepts involved and here clearly the, the core concept is being human. What does that mean? Or in context of being a person, being a person and uh, being an animal, being a machine, just to name three core, being a, being a a perfect being like a deity, like a god, like bigger or even an ancient. So there are lots of contrasts that we use in the history of philosophy that, and boundaries are shifting and studying that is conceptual work, core business of philosophers. The next one is, me is methodological in the sense that you study those people who use the concept of the human in, in studying social interaction. So if dehumanization is, a phenomenon between humans, between people, then the scientists who study that phenomenon in the humanities and the social sciences use certain methodologies and then you can criticize that and the contribution. And the, and the next level is scientists who contribute to dehumanization, not those who study it, but those who contribute to it. And you can study their methods from the perspective of a philosopher of science or um, yes. And then the third is certainly more akin to political philosophy and ethics or meta ethics, where you indeed ask normative questions how we should treat each other, which is uh, probably the most difficult thing. And since I don't believe in experts on values, um, this is not what I'm doing currently. And, um, but I'm not saying that it's impossible to do normative work in a, in a, in a serious and consistent way. So I definitely don't want to say that uh, just because I say that there are no experts on values, because you can still study the consistency of the normative judgments and their connection to facts, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's the general answer. But you also asked more specifically what the philosopher can contribute in that interdisciplinary interaction. And I think there, I always loved to do interdisciplinary work because simply you can learn so much and I'm, I'm a big fan of division of labor. And what the philosopher profits from it is mainly to be more careful in over generalizing. That's always mm -hmm. a danger in philosophy that you overgeneralize uh, because you, you just don't know the mass of data that um, are available and scientists can simply help you. I don't need to accumulate the data myself, but I need to be aware of the complexity in that science, in these sciences. And vice versa, the other disciplines can learn from the philosophers to broaden their horizon a little bit, to be more reflective, to be more flexible uh, so in, in, in changing their perspective. I think philosophers are very good in changing their perspective, sometimes maybe even too good, and then they uh, go off with that <laughs> flexibility. Um, but um, scientists can sometimes learn that, I think, from the philosophers. I hope that was, maybe that was very controversial now. Yeah, let, let's hope for the best that <laughs> scientists can learn something from us philosophers. I'm still confident, actually. And that uh, we can learn from them. Um, 
also still confident that, yeah, <laughs> this might happen. Um, uh, but let me just um, perhaps pick out one uh, philosophical issue that I came across regarding philosophy of, of um, dehumanization that also shows up in, in your own work. And that is um, a discussion of um, a view called psychological um, essentialism. So what kind of a view is that exactly? And how is it, um, how is it related to, to dehumanization? So psychological essentialism refers to claims mainly made by psychologists that humans with their psychology simply are essentialists. So when we categorize each other and also other entities, other animals, things like stones, we do so, we claim those in essentialist manners. Now the problem, the first problem is that the philosopher then discovers essences can mean so many different things, right? Mm -hmm. the, the broadening of the horizon. Um, so um, it can mean just stereotyping what it means to be human, for instance, or in addition, assuming that um, that stereotype, that uh, kind of standardized uh, thinking about human, assumes also an unchanging, um, necessary and sufficient conditions for being human. So clear boundaries between in and out, being in and being out. Uh, that somehow are inherent to us, that somehow they reside, being human resides, being human or not resides in our bodies, nowadays in our genetic makeup, um, so that we have clear cut, unobservable, fixed natures or essences. So that is heavy machinery, right? And that is traditionally in philosophy called essentialism. But in other disciplines, sometimes the, 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 the language of essences is less strict and we need to distinguish these different meanings. So you do the, I do the conceptual work of distinguishing different ways of being an essentialist. And then I, I do the methodological work that I mentioned before um, by the probing claims in demonization studies about the connection between essentialism, psychological essentialism and demonization, because it has been claimed that in order to dehumanize, it's necessary to essentialize being human beforehand. I before said you need to have a concept of the human in order to dehumanize. Right? That was that kind mm -hmm. of uh, distraction, um, uh, sub subtraction view that we discussed. But some make a more radical claim, and I think it's wrong. So I argue for that by going into the history of cases of dehumanization, where the cases give you a uh, a more complex picture where dehumanization happened with shades only. So no fixed boundaries, nothing unobservably involved, just you use observable differences between humans, say, because this of that that I can observe, they are less human. And not necessary, you don't need to assume that what you take in order to say they are less human, the kind of properties like rationality or a certain brain. Um, configuration or skull configuration that this is fixed. Um, it happens, but it's not necessarily the case that all cases of demonization involve that heavy kind of essentialism. So that's basically then the conceptual and the methodological approach, what the philosophers can add, apply to a specific thesis in, within demonization studies, and you then also get something about the sciences that contributed to the demonization in the past. So one of the examples I use uh, come from the 19th century where the racism and the sexism at the time were heavily supported by brain research. Craniology was, it wasn't really the brain, it was more the, the skull, right? Um, that was um, studied. And big hype at the time, skulls were studied like mad to give justification for widespread supremacy beliefs that women and non-Europeans are simply less intelligent than the European man and therefore deserve 
to be governed by the white man in power. And that way of how they dealt with it wasn't essentializing because it took in, it was statistically throughout. The 19th century was the century of the emergence of statistics and they were all reasoning in statistical manners, more or less, no clear boundaries and everything was justified with respect to observables and whether fixed or not wasn't innate, fixed in the sense of innateness was not their business. It was sufficient, there are differences and we can use them to justify the social hierarchies, the social order that was so supportive for those who studied these differences because scientists were men predominantly, white men. So that's what I then uh, kind of bring in mixing conceptual work um, and methodological work about the history of the sciences and the history of, or, and the contemporary claims about dehumanization. Long answer, sorry for that. No, um, I mean, there is kind of, if one looks at the work of some philosophers, including yourself working on dehumanization, some of them um, work from the perspective of one could say philosophy of science and um, others don't. Others um, uh, rather come from another subfield of philosophy. And I would um, say that at least sometimes you um, come from the philosophy of science perspective, uh, perspective to uh, reflect on dehumanization. And so I was wondering and would like to see how you, how you react to that. Um, do the sciences play um, a particularly interesting role in the history and also in the present of, of, uh, of dehumanization? So as a philosopher of science, do you think that um, studying the sciences kind of sheds new light on understanding, describing, explaining this phenomenon of dehumanization? I do think that it's very important to study the sciences because they have played and they still play the role of justifying dehumanization. In, in the mild of, now, now we luckily, at least, um, I would say right now, we at least in most places of the earth, we don't uh, have something as radical as the Holocaust, uh, but we have quite some radical <laughs> cases of atrocities. The wars, the kind of genocides um, or close to genocides that um, happen in the globe, the pandemic and the inequalities and the probably demonization that um, um, kicks in if the world gets hard, tough and hard. Um, scientists can be used to justify demonization and they have been used. And, and I think it's important to study that. Now, having said that, I think it's very important at the same time to say that scientists have pl also played the role of criticizing other scientists or the society for having dehumanization being active. So it's not the case that scientists have one particular role in a society justifying the status quo, uh, justifying the hierarchies that are part of the status quo. That's simply not the case. And in science can play that role for justifying uh, demonization, but also criticizing it. And um, it would be a mistake to, and, and that happens sometimes in science studies in, 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 in disciplines like philosophy of science, but also history of science or sociology of science, that um, one over generalizes. One sees historically, as in the 19th century, and also certainly earlier, that uh, there have been cases where the sciences justified dehumanization. But I can't overgeneralize from that context, right? Just because I looked at these cases doesn't mean that that is all there is. So that's um, where we need to be careful. And I think it's quite an important um, Point to make, especially in our contemporary times, that sciences can be, 
play both roles and which role they in fact play also depends on the institutions and the and, and how the society determines and determines the role that science can play within society because it depends not just on the goodwill of the scientists or their personal beliefs it also depends on structures social structures that allow the academy to um, to have sciences in the broad sense uh, including meaning humanities social sciences and the natural sciences to have all these together in order to um, in, organize in a way that allows them to do um, science in a critical spirit and not just in justifying the status quo or justifying the power relations that are active in our society. Yeah, I mean, let, allow me just a, a brief comment on, on this double role of the sciences. I mean, it seems to be um, an issue that comes up in um, almost all of the video conversations in this, um, in this channel by now that um, science um, has this, uh, these two aspects or can play these two perhaps more roles. Uh, on the one hand, um, it can play um, an, uh, an emancipatory role generating or shedding new light on, um, on certain phenomena, but it can also play a sort of um, uh, oppressive and um, socially problematic, politically problematic role. And um, science unfortunately and unfortunately has the potential to um, fill both roles, um, just as a, a sort of bracket um, to kind of remembering older conversations. Um, our conversation fits right into this pattern. And I think it's, it's just worth emphasizing that at this point. Uh, let me pose a, a final question to you. We've been chatting uh, for, for a while now. Um, so just um, speaking of your own research, um, what's, uh, what's next? What are the philosophical questions you would like to um, tackle in your own research on humanization? Mm, thanks. <laughs> um, it's, there are two things. The first is more on the concept of the human um, as it plays its role in uh, or with respect to demonization, because you have as so often um, claims about, for instance, a paradox of dehumanization um, that it kind of doesn't make sense to talk about the, the Nazis dehumanizing the Jewish people because they must have recognized that the, these are humans, right? So on the one hand, we agree there's dehumanization, on the other hand, that's impossible uh, cognitively, it seems. So that there, there are these kinds of paradoxes and um, you need to distinguish different levels and different aspects of the concept in order to dissolve the paradox. I mean, that's something philosophers like to do, dissolve problems into so that they go away. Um, and the other thing is connects more to the point we have now in the end that structures can influence the way that people think, social structures, and, um, and also epistemological structures. And there are three that I, I would like to study more. Um, globalization and industrialization as social structures that we inherit from the 19th century that uh, reach out till now as well. And, um, what does it to our core concept of the human that we're living in a world that is industrialized and globalized? Uh, connected, but at the same time different. And I just think very, very, very interesting also to understand our contemporary situation in the pandemic. The third one is more an epistemological structure and it is statistical thinking as I already mentioned it and its impact on the way we conceptualize each other, the shades of being human that we can grasp. And, and um, at, at the level of anthropology to say, to fully understand the impact of um, a statistical way of understanding the world 
Um, I think that that is something I want to uh, focus on in, in the next 20 years, <laughs> if I get the time. Uh, let's see. Um, it's, I know that it's a huge area, and therefore I, I allow myself to say project duration 20 years. Okay, so that gives us some time to perhaps uh, record another video then. 20 years is plenty of time, and I'd be, I'd be happy to do so. Thanks for um, this conversation about um, dehumanization and human nature, Maria, and uh, we'll hope to have you again on this um, program here soon. Thanks, Thanks. Alex. Thanks for having me.